So I think we are going to go, go ahead and get started. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Eva Chaki. I'm the director of the Hunt Institute for Engineering and Humanity. I am very excited about the seminar today because this is a really important area. Um, it's very, very important in terms of global poverty and global environmental sustainability, but it is um, also a high priority for the Hunt Institute. For those of you who have been engaged with the Institute longer than I have, uh, probably remember that there was an Engineering and Humanity Week specifically dedicated to shelter and shelter solutions. And they were displayed here on campus. Students were actually living in these shelters, trying to experience what it might be so like uh, to, uh, to, to live under uh, very difficult circumstances. And uh, so this is a major global issue um, that we are facing. We have disadvantaged communities around the world living in poor quality shelter. And this can go, this is actually a picture that I myself took in Bangladesh. Uh, this project was not about shelter, this was more about clean water and the reason why I took the picture was because they were boiling water there for pur purification, but you can see the quality of that house. Um, so, you all remember Nepal, right? The earthquake we had, but to this day, many of the families have not managed to rebuild after that disaster. Uh, not to mention refugees. Refugees around the world who live in refugee camps. And those of you who are interested in refugee issues, I would like to encourage you to talk to my colleague, Kiflu Ahmed. Kiflu, would you mind putting your hand up? He is actually, um, he, he was a scholar. He actually is a, he was a refugee. Uh, but he is, he, uh, he was a scholar at Oxford University doing research on refugees and now we are lucky enough to have him and he's doing research with us. Uh, but refugees who are supposed to be temporarily in these refugee camps end up spending years in uh, very poor quality uh, housing. But this is not just an international problem. As you all know, here in the United States, disadvantaged groups and the poor live also in very poor quality housing. And they are, they are subjected to risks that the rest of us are not. When it comes to natural disaster, when it comes to heat waves, they are living in much more difficult and risky circumstances uh, than, than the rest of us. Uh, during my many years, 18 years at the World Bank, this was probably one of the most difficult areas that I worked on. Because in part due to the scale of the problem, and also because of the complex problem. Speaking of scale, we have 600 million people around the world who live in life-threatening conditions. And most of these are women and children. There are over 800 million people around the world uh, who live in slums, urban slums. So, and that's just the worst. Those are just the worst situations. When, sorry that you cannot read this uh, perfectly, but that was a recent article in National Geographic they were focusing, many of you might have read that, uh, they had a great article about rebuilding in Nepal, and in them, there, there was this reference that there are billions of people who live in housing around the world that cannot withstand shape. Um, so, so this is a severe problem, and we are nowhere near finding a solution, which is why, um, I am really excited to introduce today's seminar. Um, I am particularly interested and excited about the approach taken here because there is the potential for what we call participatory solution. Uh, not enough is being said about the importance of participatory solutions, especially in the case of housing. How do we build more decent, higher quality, more energy efficient housing for disadvantaged communities uh, that is the kind of housing that they actually want, the kind of housing that they are comfortable about, the materials they are comfortable about, and how do we do it in a way that creates opportunities for them, that creates economic opportunities in these communities. So with that, I would like to introduce the speakers um, for today. Uh, we have um, Adam De Jong, who is the founder and CEO of Dwellers, he has over 15 years of building and construction experience. His true passion for building and construction was ignited by utilizing the more traditional construction methods of the Northeast uh, timber framing. 
He attended Norwich University where he blended a major in business administration with engineering construction management pioneering, sorry, pioneering the development of a formal construction and engineering management program. Adam's passion for longer lasting traditional construction methods led him to begin exploring the oldest building technique in the world, earth construction. Adam first worked for Earthblock International, completing projects in New Mexico and Colorado. <coughs> it was during this time that Adam began to see the necessary steps to bring this almost forgotten building method back to the mainstream. Adam then teamed up with uh, Vermeer Corporation uh, and led the design team for a new revolutionary Earthblock machine and building system that helps alleviate some of the initial equipment challenges that he experienced early on. <coughs> Founding Dwell Earth in 2010, Adam is on mission to revive the oldest, most widely used, and most environmentally friendly construction method in the world so that people around the world can have better access to health structures made of local materials. Uh, following Adam, um, we will have uh, Dr. Beth's story speak um, from SMU. He is an assistant professor here in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. His passion is teaching and research um, and educating students. And um, uh, he received his PhD in civil, and envir uh, civil engineering from Texas A&M and is an expert on structural engineering and mechanics. His research interests comprise a combination of, combination of analytical computer modeling and uh, soft computing algorithms for structural impairment detection. And um, Adam and Brett has been working very closely together and with the Hunt Institute uh, in this project that we will see today. And therefore, without further ado, I would like to invite Adam to take over. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Eva. Thank you for all coming and uh, listening about how we are trying to crack this earth block code. Um, my name again, Adam DeYoung. Um, I'm the founder of Dwell Earth. Uh, we started Dwell Earth about six years ago in a pursuit to bridge the gap, the socioeconomic gap between the wealthy and the poor. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Who has heard of earth and construction just by a show of hands quickly in one form or another? Uh, not everybody. Uh, who has heard of earth block construction in one form or another? So a few less. Um, it's interesting because earth is the oldest building material known to man. So th it should be something that we should all be familiar with, especially if we are studying the built environment in any kind of way. Um, it is the oldest building material known to man. Uh, this is the Shabam in Yemen, uh, known as the earthen Manhattan. So all of these structures are built out of earth, nothing but earth. Uh, no stabilization of cement, nothing. So they're, they're massively thick walls, um, and that's how they're able to get that kind of height. Um, and this is built in the third century, and they're still standing today. Uh, so the longevity of Earth is often what people say, oh, well, you know, this, this, this is not going to last. Well, the oldest structures uh, that are still standing are made of Earth. This is in Taos. Uh, Taos Pueblo is the oldest continually inhabited structure um, in North America. Um, again, a little bit of a different style of house. Uh, this is in France, um, Chateau Rio. Uh, and it was built in the 17th century. So, you know, this is sort of a, a, a more modern, uh, well, a, a much more high-end, almost aristocratic type of, uh, of home. So it's not just a material for, for poor folks. Um, what really drew me to earth and construction was during my research in, in looking at different things with how to how to build out of natural materials. I stumbled on earth and construction and saw a third of the world's population lives in some form of earth and structure. That's a tremendous amount of people. Um, I've seen statistics that show over 50% of the developing world lives in earth and structures. Um, of the third, excuse me, of the third of the world's population living in these earth and structures, hardly any are in the developed world like the United States um, and Europe. Uh, the reason, f the few that are here 
and I've built a few of them myself, are extremely high-end homes uh, seeking to be environmentally and eco-friendly, where around the world, the majority of the folks are doing it because that's what they have to work with due to broken supply chains with construction materials. So they're using what they have around them that's readily available to try and, and build something to keep the rain off their family's heads. Um, so that tremendous socioeconomic gap between the poorest folks that, that inhabit the planet and, and the wealthiest really intrigued me because there's not really much of a middle ground there. Um, the middle ground is, is growing more and more with living off the grid and those types of movements that are happening, but, uh, but there still is, is a pretty vast expanse in between the, those two economic groups. Um, so in forming Dwell Earth, we really set out not after an opportunity per se, but after a question to see why that big gap exists and how we can fill it in and if it's possible to fill in. Um, so this is an example of the types of, I think we missed a slide, no. Uh, this is an example of the types of construction techniques that are mostly being used around the world. This is an example of wattle and daub where they take sticks and they slam the sticks down into the ground as your verticals and then they, they weave uh, smaller, uh, smaller branches in between those uprights and then slap the clay material up against the sides. Uh, this degrades over time, the water eats it away quickly every season they need to, uh, to do a tremendous amount of, of maintenance. Um, bugs often live in here in South and Central America, the chikungunya, um, which causes congestive heart failure, um, also called the kissing disease, uh, so that's a really dangerous um, um, insect. Uh, adobe is another form of earthen construction that is pretty widespread. Um, so this is when you just take the, the muddy or the, the clay material and you, you put water in it and make it a mud and you mix straw in with it to give it some kind of structure. Um, these, these blocks are fairly weak. They're still not water resistant by any means or insect resistant by any means. And these little, uh, the little pieces of straw in them that, that help to hold everything together, it acts as sort of a, a super highway for the bugs and insects to be able to get in there. Um, so this is a pretty typical structure of what we see um, in most of the developing world. This is what the third of the world's population is living in, uh, structures that look like this. Um, so with the same exact materials that they are using to, to construct homes that look like these and materials like these, we're able to make an earth block, which is able to achieve strengths uh, superior to concrete blocks in, in some cases. So um, this block here is probably around 1200 PSI strength. Uh, concrete blocks are usually around 1900. Um, we've made blocks up to 2500 PSI. Um, so you can make tremendously strong blocks uh, in, in building materials using this material. Um, but there's variability in it, right? There's, there's different types of soils all over the place. So that's, the, that's one of the hang-ups. Um, so essentially what we're making here is a sedimentary rock. Um, instead of thousands of years of it just sitting underground and the Earth's pressure and heat um, forming the uh, geopolymers that hold everything together, we're using a machine, as you can see here, a hydraulically driven machine that really just squeezes everything together in a, in a rapid manner, uh, so we can make one every 15 seconds. Um, so we are adding cement to the mix. Uh, about 5% cement is added to the mixture. That way we're able to, to be waterproof um, and we're able to get a much stronger uh, uh, resistance for, uh, for structural integrity. PSI. Um, so here is an example of the machine. Uh, this was, the machine was featured in Popular Science twice, uh, two years ago. Um, and I, I teamed up with Vermeer after working with earth blocks in New Mexico and Colorado doing really high-end homes. Uh, the, the blocks we were using were a 10 inch by 14 inch block, so uh, bigger than this and it was about it weighed twice as much as this block so as you're stacking that block throughout the day it becomes very difficult you get about two hours worth of good work from your guys because each block weighs about 45 to 50 pounds so it's super heavy um, then you get up on your scaffolding and the work goes even slower so um, 
that aspect of it, the machine we were using had a, was automated, had a lot of uh, electrical components on it, so we'd have a great day of making blocks. Uh, the next day we'd come and the machine wouldn't be working quite right, and we'd spend four hours chasing down one little wire that had wiggled out. So one of the big mantras in this uh, design of this machine is there's not a single electrical component on this thing. Um, it's just super simple hydraulic circuit that runs everything hooked up to a, uh, a diesel motor which starts with a hand crank. Um, so we've really made a much more robust system to be able to take into the most remote uh, regions of the world. Um, uh, some of the other aspects uh, that I saw being inefficient in, in that big 10 by 14 inch block that I was talking about, uh, it doesn't really fit well into the design community. How do you put reinforcing uh, measures into it? How do you tie your roof all the way down to your, to your foundation? So holes, having holes that, uh, that could have a four inch concrete columns uh, sunk inside of the block and hidden in the structure uh, was an important aspect of the design. Um, some, in some regions, Africa, interlocking style blocks that are just dry stacked are, are very uh, sought after type of, of building system. So we, we made this block to be able to be interlocked, um, to be able to be slurry stacked. Slurry is the same material as you use to make your block, just a, like a milkshake consistency. And you just um, put a, a small bead of it down in between the block so it, it acts like a glue. So it's not a half inch mortar layer as you see in a lot of masonry construction. It's just a one or two millimeters of uh, essentially glue holding it together. The principle behind that is if you leave two bars of soap together at the sink, you come back the next day and they're, they're fused together because like materials bond. Um, so um, another aspect with this machine is that, that we needed to design in uh, is it was really frustrating with the other machine as we would go to construct the building, we'd have a half inch of variability in our block sizes, in our heights. So that would mean that our mortar line, we couldn't keep a half inch mortar line if we wanted to. It would have to go bigger or smaller or bigger. So that made construction uh, extremely time consuming and pretty arduous as well. Um, so with this machine, we're able to achieve three-dimensional accuracy every time and consistency in density because of the way that we push. So first, this is the only machine in the world that does it like this. First, we come up and we push to dimension. Uh, when we do that pre-compaction, uh, we see a pressure uh, spike in our in our operating panel here, when that pressure spikes up, it falls between a range of 1,000 and 2,000 psi. Um, that means that we are in the, the sweet moisture content range. The atmospheric conditions aren't changing things too much on us. And then what happens is these two tapered sleeves come up inside and they drive up inside of it and squeeze everything from the inside out. So it's like driving a wedge up into our block, um, giving a tremendous mechanical advantage to compact everything thoroughly from the inside out. So other earth blocks that you might come across on the internet, look at them and you'll see, you can always identify where the point of compaction is because you'll see it's, it's really tightly packed and pretty slick looking. Um, and then as you move away from it, it gets more grainy and the color kind of changes. So some blocks will push uh, to try and solve that, that height issue. Some blocks will push across the whole length of it. And the further you move away from point of compaction, the weaker the block gets. So those side compression machines, you'll have a 30 percent variability from the right side of the building material to the other. So that becomes a, a non-starter in most cases as well. So being able to make, uh, to sum it up, to be able to make a three-dimensionally accurate block um, that does not have any point in the block that's further than an inch and a half away from point of compaction um, gives us the ability to make these blocks much stronger and, uh, and much more um, yeah, much more repeatable so we can do it over and over and over again and the atmospheric changes aren't really um, playing into our process. So here's just some stats on our um, of our block. So all soil is made up of some um, some combination of clay, silts, and sands. Uh, we use cement or lime or fly ash, blast furnace slag as a stabilizer. 
Um, the cement is usually the easiest and there is the best uh, supply chain built worldwide for cement. Uh, lime is much more environmentally friendly because lime is cyclical. So it starts out as limestone, you crush it down, you fire it, CO2 is released, and then you hydrate it, and then it drinks that CO2 back in to turn itself back into limestone. So we can make a CO2 neutral product, a uh, building material, by, by stabilizing with lime. Um, if we use things like fly ash and blast furnace slag, which are waste stream materials already, um, those can be added in, in place of the cement or lime as a type of alumina silica cement, which, is, uh, which really does work quite well with the, uh, with the, the clay molecules that are in the block. Um, rice husk ash is another byproduct that can be used uh, that, that really is molecularly similar to, uh, to fly ash, which comes from coal burning power. <coughs> um, so a couple of the structural components that went into the design of this uh, of this block and the geometry of this block were one again we needed to have the be able to to reinforce vertically um, be able to chase conduits for light switches and pipes um, we can use the the holes that line up for those chases um, with the other type of building material the other type of earth block I was telling you about the solid one we'd have to build the, the walls and then we'd come back through with a grinder and we'd cut big channels in to chase our uh, chase our, our utilities through and then we'd have to plaster over all of that so that becomes you're cutting into your, your structure and it, it kind of limits the, the structural um, integrity and it's time consuming and it's expensive then to come back and plaster over. Um, and if there's any issues with your electricity, you know, wires or, or whatever later on, you can't pull new ones. So it's, uh, you're pretty stuck with it. So being able to pull utilities through, being able to reinforce vertically, and we can also reinforce horizontally because we left a space between uh, the bottom of our groove and the top of our tongue. <clears throat> so we're able to incorporate things like the, um, the, the wire masonry ladder that is often called out in codes for uh, brick construction or CMU, you know, cement blocks. Um, we can hide that right in that channel and be able to put a, a mortar layer in there. Um, so we've been able to achieve a, a full-on building system with this and for lack of a better term, you know, we, we've, we're trying to take this from sort of the hippie hobby world to something that can be understood by architects and engineers who are working in, you know, the, the mainstream built environment. Um, as you can see with, uh, with, with the reinforcements horizontally, um, we, can, we can hide little bond beams in our in our wall by simply flipping the blocks over so we'll start with our rails up from the foundation and then when we get to our midpoint we'll flip it over so we can have an inch and a half uh, concrete uh, beam that ties everything together all the way around and you won't see the the big thicker mortar joints either um, strength so we talked a little bit about you know variability from one side to the other um, strength is a is a tremendous one we we want to be able to to have a, a building material that mimics the strengths and properties of concrete blocks or fired bricks um, so that double compression is one of the aspects in uh, our production techniques that really makes our blocks uh, much stronger um, so this is a big dump truck that in this is in South Africa uh, this is a big dump truck that we loaded up with some blocks and drove it up on this block and uh, that laterite soil, the reddish type of soils, is uh, phenomenal for, for this type of construction technique. Buildability. Um, around the world, many of the folks who are, who are using earth for their construction systems do not have any kind of formalized education, uh, vocational or otherwise. So how to construct this stuff uh, becomes the challenge. You know, we're, we're not just slapping mud up against sticks anymore. We're, we're actually building a masonry system. So this wall was constructed in uh, northern Mozambique uh, by folks who 
had never even used a toilet before. So this is the first time that they had any kind of masonry units in this village. Um, this was a, for a large oil company, Anadarko, um, out of Houston. And we were do, uh, doing prototypes for a relocation program for them. Um, so it, it, it's very buildable. The folks that have never built before, um, if you go to, to Dwell Earth's YouTube channel or, or Facebook, you'll, you'll see a video of, uh, of a couple of young kids that are, are stacking these blocks. Uh, and that was my test to see if we could give this to somebody who had no building experience and have them be able to have a positive impact in the building process. And it turns out that they could, and they can do a great job. This is those same guys. Um, in, in Mozambique and ladies. Um, the ladies uh, are, you know, they work tremendous with this as well. Um, they really thrive in the, the finishing, so the tuck pointing of everything, and they make it just, yeah, the guy, they make the, the guys look terrible at that. <laughs> um, uh, South Africa, this is a project that we did in Mtata, South Africa, just near Nelson Mandela's birthplace. Um, this is a neat pro program. This was an auto construction program that we did in El Salvador. So uh, rural coffee farmers, this project was done on the side of a volcano. So we took a land cruiser and drug our equipment up on the side of this volcano. And uh, the, the men are usually the ones that are going out in the fields and collecting all the beans. And they'll get a you know, big, uh, big burlap sack full for $5 each day. Um, so the women were really the drivers of this project. They were the one, in this picture doesn't uh, do it justice, you know, they, <laughs> they were all there for the first couple days, but the women were really the ones that were carrying all the buckets, screening the soil, um, building and stacking the walls. Uh, so this is, a, this is a picture of them inserting the, one of the first horizontal reinforcing courses. So tremendous amount of earthquakes in El Salvador. So we put a lot of horizontal reinforcements in this and these, build, these uh, structures have really lasted a long time. Uh, this is Katie. This is her new house. Uh, that was what was just being constructed there. So this is really like an uh, like the Amish do. You know, the whole community comes together and they help one another build this house. Then they move next door, and the owners of this house are involved in the next one. So the whole community is helping each other build these homes. Um, uh, this project was done in Mozambique as well, uh, uh, Nampula, so this is more central Mozambique where they're building a vocational training center. Um, and this is in northern Malawi where these guys are also doing a vocational training center. Um, so it's kind of, this, this picture, I really like this picture because I, I usually go in and I do a two week training, how to run the machines, how to test your soil, how to run the machines, how to make the blocks, how to build with the blocks, all in two weeks. So I throw a lot at them. But then I get pictures like this back and it just you know makes my heart sing. And it really makes my heart sing when they start thinking outside of the box. So they figured out how to do little curbs here with the blocks for, for little architectural details. So you know it, it's really awesome when you, when you see it kind of coming out the way you'd hoped and then growing even more so. Um, so another one in, in uh, Mozambique. Um, this one is at, on a border town in Mexico, right over from uh, Yuma, Arizona, San Luis Rio, Colorado. Um, the houses before were made out of pallets and just the, the sheet metal roof, which was tremendously uh, hot. It was like an oven in those houses. So now the, the earth blocks uh, have made a structure that costs the same as w when they were importing all of the uh, materials from the the Home Depot in in Yuma. They were they're just making them all out of U OSB and two by fours. It costs the same, um, but it's a much more structure has much more structural integrity, and it keeps the the occupants much cooler um, because as the days uh, go goes on, you can touch that wall and it stays cool. Um, the thermal mass of these blocks and the clay um, being able to absorb moisture uh, has the ability to always have an evaporative cooling effect. So that moisture that's coming in is slowly dissipating out and it's constantly keeping the blocks cooler. Um, I'm going to touch more on that in just a moment. Um, <clears throat> So I've showed you guys, you know, a lot of, of what's going on in the developed or developing world. So in the developed world, 
a lot of people are looking to this for because it's eco-friendly, because we can make a much more energy efficient house. Um, it, we can make it disaster resistant because we can engineer how our whole wall system is working, how it ties in from the, the peak of the roof, how it ties in, the roofing system ties into the bond beam, which is a concrete beam that goes around the top, and then how that beam ties down into the foundation through our vertical, uh, vertical reinforcements. Uh, they're mold proof. The pH of the blocks and the way that the blocks are able to self-regulate their uh, humidity levels um, prevents mold and different bacteria from growing. Um, bug proof. They're too hard uh, for, for bugs and termites and things and the chikagunya to, to get into. Um, Non-toxic. It's made out of uh, the, the local soils and materials so unless we're in you know an inner city type of environment where there's pollutants and contaminants minutes to, to contend with uh, it is non-toxic um, fireproof you can't you can't light this on fire we did uh, I'll show you a picture here shortly of a uh, of a big game farm compound that I did in uh, South Africa so we had to put two 60 foot uh, lightning rods up to protect it from lightning strikes and then on the back side one you know Murphy's law one got nailed by a, uh, a lightning strike and all of the thatch roof burned all the furniture every stick of wood burned out of there but the walls uh, the walls stayed um, bulletproof we've done some extensive ballistic te ballistics testing with the Army Corps of Engineers um, they, they did five different wallets in a circle and put a 50 pound frag bomb in the middle they're looking at this for applications for rapid uh, base deployments. Uh, if they're able to just drop a machine in and use the indigenous materials, their supply chain risk has been uh, greatly reduced. Um, uh, so, and they've also did a couple of, uh, of wallets where they took everything from small arms fire to armor piercing 50 caliber. So the the wall system that had a row of blocks and then just soil in the middle and then another row of, row of blocks, um, it, an armor piercing 50 caliber shell could not pierce it. Oops, I'm skipping. Soundproof, um, if you're in an earthen structure you can't really hear anything that's going on outside. Um, it, it just dampens and deadens the sound. I think that there's some correlation between bulletproof and, and the sound, how it dissipates that energy when it hits the, uh, when it hits the block. Uh, regulates humidity and it regulates temperature. These are the biggest opportunities for uh, us making a more energy efficient house. So. Uh, there was a study done in Germany. Um, in Germany, there's quite a bit of, of earthen construction. Um, there was a study done where it was all data logged for a period of five years. And in that five year period, uh, humidity would spike and it would drop. Um, but the interior humidity, indoor air quality, uh, only varied from 50% plus or minus 5%. So you're right in that sweet spot. Um, the sweet spot of your indoor air quality is between 40 and 60%. If you're below 40, your trachea starts to dry out. Um, that's why in the winter time we start to get more colds and coughs and upper respiratory infections is because our trachea is dry, so more stuff is able to get down into our lungs and infect us. Whereas if uh, in the summertime and springtime when it's more humid, you've got a lot more mold growth and a lot more allergy attacks and uh, a lot more fungus kind of starting to, to appear inside the buildings. Um, also regulating the temperature. Um, due to the thermal mass, it takes a long time to heat this thing up or cool this thing down. So that helps take a lot of strain off of your heating and cooling systems. Um, if it's summertime, you, you, you're, you're trying to keep your, your building cool. Um, your insulation layer on the outside is blocking all of that, that hot from, from coming and, and infiltrating your, your block. Um, and then on the inside, your blocks are cool, so it's really holding on to that cool air so you're not, your air conditioning system is not needing to kick on nearly as often. Um, and then vice versa for, for heat. Uh, so this is a, one of the high-end homes um, that I was talking about. This is in Pella, Iowa. Um, it's got the, you know, the lick and stick veneer uh, rocks on the outside. Um, but on the inside we left a few, there, there's a few areas where it was kept natural. Um, this was a, a very, very uh, fun build in southern Colorado. Excuse me. This was all 
um, circles. There was not a straight line in the entire structure. Um, so it was a difficult build, but uh, again, this is the, the project with that 10 by 14 inch block. So this is where a lot of the ideas for this building system and this machine came from, was the challenges that I faced on this. So this is a $2 million house because of a lot of those challenges. Um, there, there's so much variability in the wall system. The engineering for this thing was uh, just through the roof complicated because we had to hide big steel posts in and around adobes and um, the, the, the homeowners wanted this to feel like it just came up out of the earth so we couldn't have any you know steel or concrete or anything like that showing so um, this is the inside of that structure. It really came out beautiful in the end, but we've got big um, vaults, you see, the, the big barrel vaults that go around corners as well. So it's, uh, it's a pretty architecturally uh, amazing building. Um, a lot of light, a lot of big boulders in this thing. So again, that mantra of, of uh, of keeping it with the earth. Here is the, a large game farm that I built in, in rural South Africa, uh, Mokopane. It's about halfway between uh, Johannesburg and the um, Zimbabwe border. Um, so this is one big structure in the middle where there's a kitchen, living room area, kind of a common space, and, every, uh, and then there's four chalets around it. Um, so this project was a dream of mine because I, I got a lot of my experience through timber framing up north so my big dream is to go to a lot and t uh, harvest the trees that will go into the structure so all of the all of these big upright posts are the trees that we harvested off of this lot um, then all of the walls are made out of the local soil and the roof is made out of local grass. Um, so here on the side of highways we go and we, we mow everything down uh, with, with you know tractors and mowers. There these guys go around with sickles and they, they cut the, the high tall grass and that's what goes to make the, uh, the roofs there. Um, here's the inside of that structure. So the walls are about uh, I think they're 18 feet around these uh, around these perimeter walls, and then the the wall that is kind of right above us, where this picture is taken, is 35 feet to the peak. Um, the kitchen. So you know, it, this is not just a building system for for the poor. Um, we can make amazing structures with this as well. So um, buildings. Are some, the, the buildings are some of the heaviest polluters that we have, or is the heaviest polluter that we have for CO2 emissions. Um, this graph is um, by the US Department of Energy and shows how taxing uh, buildings are on, on our environment. Um, and that's through heating, through cooling, through uh, air conditioning, you know, with, with everything that goes into trying to keep your house comfortable takes a tremendous amount of energy. Um, Buildings that are made out of bricks and out of concrete blocks have more thermal mass, so again, they're able to hold on to whatever they have, um, but not as well as earth. Buildings that are made out of wood, you're, you're banking everything on the insulation layer. So if your air conditioning is not running, that, that wood frame structure is going to heat up or cool down pretty rapidly um, because there's no thermal mass inside there. So 74.9% uh, of all of the U.S. energy consumption goes into heating and cooling and taking care of our, uh, of our structures, of our buildings. So there's a tremendous opportunity there to try and make, and that's what LEED and HERS and all these different environmental ratings are doing, is trying to make a dent in this. Um, and this material can do uh, can take a great chunk of this 75% um, by making a much more energy efficient uh, wall system. So embodied energy, how much, how much energy goes into creating an earth block or any type of building material? Uh, earth blocks have the lowest. Um, you see kiln fired bricks, which is a, a very efficient style of, of, of firing the bricks that we only really have in the developed world. Um, and then you see country fired bricks, which is how most of the world is making their bricks. Like in El Salvador, the, the, row of the, the roads where um, bricks were fired, you look up on the mountains and they're just clear cut. 
So they're taking all of that free uh, natural resource being wood and firing it and burning it so that we're able to, so that they're able to get some kind of uh, material to build homes with. Uh, but it's extremely energy intensive and it pollutes a ton. In Mexico, they'll use tires, they'll use trash. Uh, so you, it really hurts the lungs when you're breathing around those areas. Um, and CO2 emissions uh, as well, earth blocks are extremely low because of the types of materials we're putting in. It's only 5% cement. Um, if it's lime, it's even lower than this. So, and then um, concrete blocks are even, are even higher because of the amount of firing in the cement itself. So the amount of firing in the cement, um, there's a whole bunch of different rock types and the, the duration that they need to fire them and the amount of energy that it takes to get them that hot uh, just is super energy uh, consuming and it puts out a lot of CO2. Um, so I've talked a little bit about thermal mass and how these structures are able to stay cooler and moderate humidity levels. Um, this chart is a good visualization of what's called the solar adobe study. Um, so there were three structures that were built uh, exactly the same right next to each other out of cement, out of an adobe, and out of earth blocks. Um, this, uh, the ambient temperature during this study averaged 107 degrees, so it was in the desert's extremely hot environment. Um, the cement ended up being four degrees warmer, so it would actually heat up and, and actually gain heat from the, uh, uh, from the ambient temperature. Um, adobes stayed below. Uh, by 12 degrees and then earth block stayed below by 16 degrees. So that passive cooling and the material itself really lends to uh, a much more energy efficient wall system without any kind of mechanical wires and switches and things. Um, so some of the challenges with, uh, with earth block construction and earthen construction in general is uh, since we've gone down this road uh, with cement and with uh, more modern materials, uh, the art of building with earth has been lost. Uh, one of the, the big um, components of that is, and one of the most prevalent questions we get is, how do I know if I've got the right soil to make a good earth block house with? Well, this is a uh, soil gradation chart. So any soil that you can find in the world will land somewhere on this chart. Um, that becomes challenging when we're trying to figure out how to get our blocks into this ideal mix point, right? Um, how to amend it the right way, how to stabilize it. So that is what we are teaming up with the Hunt Institute and SMU to figure out um, how to make this much more rapid and intuitive. Um, when I began Dwell Earth, it was, you know, just kind of take and, and rub the, this together, put some water in it and kind of feel it, touch it, but there was no science to it. So uh, we developed a soils testing kit that fits into a little, looks like a little spy briefcase uh, that we're able to take out in the field and we're able to quickly get um, our particle distribution analysis. So how much sand, silt, and clay is in the, in the soil itself. Uh, we're able to make many blocks. We're able to uh, design mixes much more efficiently. Um, but all of that still takes about a week to 10 days to figure out if you've got the right stuff to work with. And then longer if you want to start putting it through wet-dry cycles and uh, freeze-thaw cycles. Because it takes seven days for the, the cement to cure in the, in the block. So um, we need to figure out a way to make this a lot easier to use. Uh, much more scientific so that when we have a soil that is say right here which is pretty good uh, pretty good soil how strong is it going to be when I go to make earth blocks with it uh, how water resistant will it be how abrasive uh, how abrasion resistant will it be so all of those different factors play in uh, based upon the different types of soils that we have so creating a tool that can rapidly analyze and give suggestions on how to stabilize and how to amend is is what we are working on currently. So that is the first step and something that uh, in my research and going through all of these different periodicals and things has always been skipped over. Everybody uh, who's done earth block research seems to go to the end product. You know, let's take this block and let's put it in a wall system and let's shake it around and see what it does. But they're not paying attention really to the inputs uh, and, and the variability of the inputs. So if we don't take that first step, then we can't get to the next step of standardization and really uh, 
uh, and, and getting thorough results or uh, accurate results in in how these you know in plane shear and things like that uh, actually play in. So quality control is really the first step. Um, another challenge is that there is no uh, worldwide accepted code for earth and construction, for rammed earth, for earth blocks. Um, there, there's no all-encompassing code. So Germany's got a code, Australia's got a code, New Zealand's got the most comprehensive code. Uh, we've got a couple here in the US. New Mexico's got a, a really poor code. Um, they call out for 300 PSI for an earth block to, to, to need to meet 300 PSI. I mean, I wouldn't put that in my house if you, if you paid me. <laughs> so, um, uh, so we've really got some inadequate standardization, but again, we must take the first step to be able to go through that next step and standardize everything. Um, and then the next phase is automation. So we, we talked about this, this has been really successful. We, I've traveled to 18 countries and, and set up different projects for a lot of uh, nonprofits and NGOs. Um, everywhere from Mongolia, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, um, all through Africa, Central and South America. Um, and where labor prices are low, we can make blocks for 25 to 40 cents, depending on that labor, uh, that labor rate. Cement costs around the world are pretty, are pretty steady. Um, however, as we come back to the U.S. and people are looking at it here and wanting to be cost effective, there's a lot of labor involved in it. You know, how we batch the, the soil into the mixer and how we need to take the block off the machine and stack it on the pallet. Um, so that labor cost drives up the price here. So where we are consuming a tremendous amount of energy um, in houses that are built in the, with the, the regular materials that we're using now, um, a barrier to getting a better wall system really becomes the the cost of the block itself. So here we're able to make a block for about a dollar to a dollar twenty-five. So automation is a area that we are working on currently, where we're able to reduce the amount of people that it takes to to spit out these blocks here, because um, one we're we're not used to that type of day in day out manual labor like most of the world is. Two, it's driving up the cost, and um, and in other places, you know, the job creation is is a huge uh, is a huge need. So auto construction programs and things like that can still work, but we just need to to tweak the the equipment setup just slightly so that we're able to to fit that into our context. So we're about a year away from from rolling out our completely automated system, um, and then partnerships. So. So when you're driving around, there's tremendous amounts of construction going on in the Dallas area. And for these big skyscrapers and things, they've got to go and they've got to take out a tremendous amount of soil and then they've got to truck it across town and find some place to dump it. And then they've got to pay to dump it. Um, and then uh, it becomes an expensive endeavor. So through partnerships with construction companies, we could help alleviate their pain of needing to go and, and tip and pay all these tipping fees, and it would help to uh, offset the cost of uh, of, of getting our, our uh, input materials. So those partnerships with uh, large construction companies here will also help drive the price of our blocks way down. So um, that is uh, our overview, and I will pass it off to, to Brett now to uh, show how we are combating the biggest challenge of the quality control. Alright, so uh, my name is Brett Story. I'm an assistant professor in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. I'm a uh, structural engineer. Um, so as, as uh, Eva mentioned before, my passion is uh, structural engineering obviously, but also the education of others to solve difficult problems. So I would, I would identify my true passion as solving or seeking out impossible problems and solving them, right? That's what we try to do and try to train a whole bunch of other people to do that so we can raise the state of the art for everybody, okay? And so uh, this uh, opportunity has come along and it's just been tremendously enjoyable. Now, uh, you just heard a lot of really good information that you can't get very many places. Adam is a wealth of knowledge that I have not encountered before in this area. I, I learn more from him in, in 30 minutes than he can learn from me, I'm, I'm certain of that. So, um, I'll just try to keep up, all right, so. 
so Adam laid out some of the challenges with uh, CEB, right? So I think we're all pretty convinced now on the pictures we've seen and uh, some of the awesome things he's done around the world that this is a this is a really awesome solution, right? But there are there are challenges. So uh, one man's challenge is another man's opportunity, something like that. So that's the way we we look at this. So what what are the challenges from the structural side? Structural performance. The very first thing we have to ask is, is this building that we're going to build safe, right? If it can do all these other things, but if it's not safe, nobody's, nobody's going to want to be in there, right? And so uh, there are some specific questions. Uh, what is the site-specific compressed earth block strength? This is obviously dependent on the soil that you're, where you're building, right? This is a, a huge issue, okay? The second question is, all right, if we know what the soil is there, can we achieve field compressed earth block strengths comparable to more pro prolific building materials? Like this building, you see a lot of concrete here. We're really, as engineers, structural engineers, we're really good at designing concrete buildings, timber buildings, uh, steel buildings, that sort of thing. We're confident in our ability to do that, all right? Can we get there with the, uh, the CEBs? Uh, then how do we optimize structural configurations to capitalize on the strengths of CEBs? You saw a lot of cool kind of arch vault uh, uh, structures uh, that Adam's already built. We know we can do it. We just have to convince the everybody that we can do it repeatedly and in a standardized way. Uh, there's also issues of energy efficiency. So it's kind of the same questions, just uh, uh, termed in uh, or given in terms of energy efficiency. Does the soil content at the site affect how energy efficient it will be? Can we optimize the structural configurations again? Right? To capitalize on that. Okay, so all of these challenges can be addressed through engineering analysis and design. Those are two different things, both critically important. You can't, you can't do a design unless you've done some analysis, right? So, uh, in talking with Adam, the, the critical need that we have established is that of standardization. How do we do this? Uh, how do we have do a standard framework in one site that translates to another site that translates to another site? Okay. Um, so scalable engineering analysis design requires standardized tools, uh, standardi standardization and efficient tools. Okay. We have standards for lots of different design codes. So there's masonry uh, standards, there's concrete standards, steel design. So my students are starting to get nervous because here's books they've seen before. Uh, from the energy side, we have uh, ASHRAE, you know, deals with in energy things and then kind of the uh, the head, the head of it all is the International Code Council that does the International Building Code, all these, all these big codes. So we're inundated with codes except for CEB construction. We do not have a code for that, a unified code for that. Uh, so what are the analysis and design tools? Well, uh, these, these design manuals, those prescribe appropriate analysis and design procedures that anybody with an engineering background can do. So if you're going to build a steel building, you go to the AISC code and you do what it says. If you're going to build concrete, you do that. So we need these, uh, we need analysis and design tools for this, this new cool um, uh, compressed earth block construction. So you can have computer programs that do analysis for you, charts, tables, design aids, that sort of thing. All right, so if you're a faculty member, you're looking for research opportunities, which I always am, and this is certainly one. So the goal here is to establish standardization frameworks for all pertinent analysis, design, construction, and implementation stages of CEB construction. That's our big goal. If we can accomplish that, then we're on our way to making this a scalable, widespread uh, building type. The first step, as Adam laid out, is soil classification. What in the world do we have at the site where we want to build a building? We have to know that. If you don't know that, you're dead in the water. Okay? And so we need methods for rapid assessment. This task of soil classification is not an unsolved problem. We are really very good at that at engineer, as engineers. We classify soils all the time. USCS classification, AASHTO, which is the highway side of things, has their own classification. But what you have to do for that is a bunch of laboratory testing. Okay, so I'm going to take a second here to point out Jay Sitton. He's the uh, uh, graduate student working on this. He's the brains behind the operation. And so he has done a lot of this soil testing and some of the uh, analytical work that you're going to see. So he can tell you exactly what goes into all that, uh, how time intensive it is to do these classifications. So what we want to do is a method for rapid assessment. So I'm going to, so visually what this means is 
you have a bucket of soil, right? So you go out to your site and you get a bucket of soil or a pile of soil or whatever it is. We want to know, based on that soil, what is the mix acceptability? Will this make a block? And then beyond that, what can we add to this to achieve a certain strength? That's what we really care about. You want a certain strength. That's what all the design codes want. You have to have at least this much strength or you can't build the building. Right? So we want to we want to know the relationship between quantitative and qualitative data, right? So numbers about the data or numbers about the uh, soil somehow. That's what uh, lab testing gives you, ASTM testing, standardized testing. It will give you numbers about things. But what is also important is what Adam touched on earlier, and that's qualitative data. How does the soil feel? What happens when it gets wet? Is it kind of slick? Is it shiny? Is it dull? Those sorts of things are very important keys to determining if it's an acceptable mix or strength. So I don't want to throw out any data. I want the numbers. I'm an engineer. I love numbers. But I also want how does it feel? How does it look? Okay. So the question is, what is the relationship between those two things? This is a very difficult problem to solve. Uh, our way of solving that currently is blank, but it's really this man, right? So when he is, he has got all this experience, he loves to go out and, and do this. And so I've seen him do it. It's kind of kind of creepy almost. So he, he gets down in the dirt and he kind of eh, needs five cups of water, right? And a pinch of salt or something like that. No, it's not no salt, but uh, but it is kind of like baking. It's an it's an art. He has honed his skills to be able to take that qualitative data and also developed his little spy briefcase of simplified methods to get some quantitative data and based on that he can tell you if it's going to work or not and and this sort of thing okay the problem the only problem i can see with adam is there's only one of him right and so unless we want to ship him to every site and it'd be hard to do if we wanted to do two sites on the same day right but so it's difficult so how can we not replace Adam, but replicate Adam in some, in some way. And that is, uh, the way I'm going to go through is something called neural networks. Okay, now that's a, uh, can be an intimidating thing, it's really not. We'll, we'll look through here uh, shortly and see that it's a very straightforward method to relate this qualitative and quantitative data to anything we want to know about the block. Once we can do that, then we can start looking at strength characterization, energy characterization. We can do uh, cool testing uh, down in the lab. That's an axial load frame where we'll break some blocks and see how strong they were. And we can look at performance in varying conditions. But the first hurdle is finding out what in the world we have and how we can use it. Uh, so before we go in too much, and there's going to be some numbers here. I'm a professor. I can't, I can't handle not doing uh, some sort of exercise, but it's not, not too big a deal, right? So neural networks are simply a way to find patterns and relationships between two things that may seem related or may not be related. Okay? As engineers, we love equations. If I know the equation, you give me the input, I give you the output. We're really good at that. So that looks like this. Say the input is x1 and x2, just 6 and 4. Okay, that's the input that you have to work with. And the function that we're dealing with is I'm going to add up x1 and x2. We all know how to do that. 6 plus 4, we have the function. We get the output is 10. Right? We know that function ahead of time. Right? We really are comfortable operating like this. And so the output is determined by a given function. Okay? The function we're trying to find here is unknown. It's Adam. Right? We don't know exactly how his brain works when he's got down in there feeling the dirt and looking at the numbers and that sort of thing. So we're trying to find that, that function. So what does that look like in a simple example here? Well, say we have a bunch of inputs. All right? So now we have 6 and 4, uh, 3 and 0, and 1 and 5, for example. So you know a bunch of different inputs, and you know you don't know the function. Right? We don't know what the function is right now, but we know the outputs to those inputs. All right, so this is kind of like trial and error, okay? So I know that if I have six and four, if I supply that to the unknown function, somehow I get two, all right? So all of your neural networks are starting to key in on what this relationship is, right? And three and zero, I get three, okay? And one and five, I get negative four, right? So now most of us, although it is just kind of after lunch, have determined that this, uh, what this function is. But the, the point here is that the function is determined by examining inputs and outputs. So I look at the input and the output and I say, okay, I kind of see that function. In this case, it's very straightforward. It's the first input minus the second input. 
right? So what we can do is look at experience, look at examples of things that have happened, what, uh, look at Adam's knowledge, look at uh, knowledge that we can uh, discover down in the lab and determine this relationship like that. So this is a way to determine very complicated relationships. This is a silly example. You don't need a neural network to come up with that, but for the, for the soil classification problem, that's a little bit more difficult. So uh, Jay started looking at, all right, there's, there's a couple of tests we have. So we're going to look at the field test. That's the SPY kit that Adam mentioned before. And we have these very rigorous, strict ASTM tests. Probably there's some relationship between those. Those are giving similar information somehow. So we can look at a direct comparison of some numerical results. That's quantitative data. And then we have this neural approach that can fuse both that quantitative data, but then also the qualitative data. Somehow we can put that into our neural network, into our learning scheme to say, uh, slick means good or bad, I, I don't know, we'll figure that out. So Jay started looking at uh, the uh, dwell earth tests, those are the field tests, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six tests there, and how they might correlate with some standard, standard tests. And said, yeah, maybe the wash test is kind of gives us some information similar to a sieve test, et cetera, et cetera. So this is where, this is where we started. And this becomes clear here. So this is a field test versus an ASTM test, and what we're looking at here is test tube particle gradation. What that means is we're trying to figure out how much uh, sand, how much silt, how much clay, that sort of thing, and how much percentage of each of those is in each soil. So on the left-hand side here, we have the test tube particle gradation. That is a uh, dwell earth test. That's a test you can do out in the field. Doesn't take very long to do it. Um, you don't need laboratory equipment, that sort of thing. We do essentially the same type, we get the same output with an ASTM sieve analysis, which does take some time. All right, you got to have a laboratory, you got to have special equipment, that sort of thing. Both, the idea here is that both of these somehow describe the same, or somehow produce the same output. Now, the only problem with that is there's not a great correlation here, right? There's at least not one that I see. It kind of looks like somebody sneezed on the screen a little bit, right? What we'd like to see is a nice straight line, and then we say, okay, it's a linear relationship between those two. So what we tried to do, as we always do as engineers, number one goal of engineers is turn data into a linear relationship. We tried to do that. There's kind of a line that goes through there, and the R squared value is only 0.21, right? The R squared value should be somewhere like one, if it's, if it's worth anything but it's not, right? So our first and, and sometimes best chance at, at getting this was not successful, right? We have an idea there has to be a relationship between field tests and ASTM tests. There, there is, it's the same information, but this is a very difficult uh, function to convince people is, is appropriate to model this, right? So we uh, tried, something, tried something else. Uh, but which we'll get to here shortly. So this is the soil classification, this is the laboratory procedure, this is what uh, Jace has been doing. We're going to try to use neural networks to do this, okay? We got field tests, test tube, pin test, stick test, shine test, jar test. We want to try to train a neural network to relate the field test to the ASTM results. If we can do that, we can classify the soil and we can begin to start to answer these questions on strength and energy efficiency and that sort of thing. All right, but we have to train the neural network. So for the neural network, we need lots of training examples. That means getting lots of data. That means Jay spends lots of his time down in the basement. No windows down there, it's tough. Well, it's actually good because he doesn't know, doesn't know if it's nice outside or raining. He just stays down there and works. So he does both of them. He takes a soil sample and he does the top, the top, uh, top row there is ASTM tests. Those are tests that we have to do down in the lab. The bottom tests are field tests, but he does the same tests on, both t uh, on the same soil type. This is the input and output training data for the neural network, right? So this is how we're gonna train the neural network to uh, we give it field tests, which is what we can get when we're out in, the, out in the sticks or wherever we're at, where we don't have lab equipment, but we can extract what the ASTM results are from there. Okay, so that's the, that's the data uh, acquisition process. And it takes several days to do each one of these tests, so it's, it's pretty work intensive. Jace does a good job at that. So, some preliminary networks. So the first network we wanted to try to do is saying, okay, if we have ASTM results, 
Can we train a neural network to give us a USCS classification? We should be able to do this because there's actually a function that does this. If we can't do this, the neural networks won't work. Right? We can do this anyway right now. This is just kind of a simple little, a very simple example on how to do this. Right? There's a flow chart that you enter in those three percent fines, plasticity index, and liquid limit that come from the ASTM results, and you should get the classification. Right? So our neural network, our, our first attempt at this, got this correct 94% of the time. That's pretty good. Okay. Uh, so then uh, we kind of got that one under our belt. We're comfortable with that. Let's now relate dwell earth or field test results to ASTM results. This is kind of what we're going for, right? We want the field tests to somehow relate to ASTM tests because then if we get the ASTM results correct, then we know the classification. Right? Okay, and so of course, as all things do in research, the first time you go through it worked not very well. Hard to do. That number is not impressive, and it's not actually unreasonable to have an unimpressive number there because the, remember the first plot where it looked like a sneeze on the page? That was a very hard thing to learn. The first neural network didn't learn that very well. Okay, so, and I was kind of concerned about this, you know, real mad at Jace, but he said, I think it's okay, I've got, a, I've got an idea. I said, okay, what is it? He said, well, what if we skip the step here? What if we skip going from field test to ASTM and then ASTM to USCS classification? I said, okay, that sounds pretty good. Let's just see what happens. So what we decided to do um, is look at field tests and try to train a neural network to go right to USCS classification, skipping over that kind of complicated step. Okay, and so we have uh, out of 23 possible USCS classifications, right now we have soil that occupies 11 of those distinct classifications. So there's 11 soil types is what we have. And those are represented in 19 different soil samples. Okay, so the neural network here, after he got everything trained and it does very well, now we're back up to 94%. So skipping that step that you don't need to, don't need to worry about. The neural network has enough, uh, enough power and is robust enough to go right directly from field test to USCS classification. So we're kind of cutting out that, that middle step. Uh, here are the results of the, of the classification. So here, uh, the left-hand side is the known classification. That's what we know we have because we, we, we know this data so we can do the USCS flowchart and get what it is. And the neural network using only dwell earth field test data gives us in every case but one uh, the correct correct soil type. Now the issue here is well how close is clay sand so this is the one that is incorrectly identified. How close is clay sand to fat clay? It's pretty close. So the question now is if I'm just off, so there's 23 classifications when really there could be like three classifications, sand, clay, and silt. So sometimes you got silty clay and sandy silt, I, I don't know, there's a bunch of different combinations. So does that incorrect response really negatively affect how this network is going to predict strength? We don't know, we haven't started that. But we're, we're optimistic that this is a, a, certainly a very uh, promising approach. Uh, so looking ahead. We're going to continue to collect soil data for model improvement. My pictures are less impressive than Adam's pictures, right? This is just a picture down in my lab of a bunch of dirt, right? But that's okay. Uh, we're, you know, we're, we're down in the trenches doing it. All right, so we have to collect more soil. And so the issue here is that a neural network can only learn things that it has been taught, right? You can't, you can't teach it over only uh, 11 classifications and then ask it some classification it's never seen before, right? That's not, I mean, that's pretty intuitive. A lot of us have always, uh, have had exams where we thought it was going to be over topic A and we get there and the professor was really honorary that morning when we wrote the exam and it's all over exam uh, topic B, right? And we don't do very well on that because we didn't study B, we studied A, right? Now I would never do that. But uh, it happens, right? So you can only train, the network is only going to do well on things that it's seen before. So we need to get lots more soil. So every, every time we can, every time I see Adam, we ask him for soil, right? And he usually has some just to give to us. Okay, once that's done, we're going to investigate different uh, uh, mixed designs and what their strengths are down in the lab. That's, that's Jace's next task is to 
create, uh, create some blocks. So here you see kind of a load frame. This isn't my lab. This is a, uh, a different lab. We haven't built a, built a frame or anything to do this. But here they're doing uh, uh, CMU, right? Well, we want to replace that wall with uh, compressed earth blocks and do similar tests, both at the component level, just seeing how strong that brick is, and then also how it behaves as a system. Those are two different, uh, different uh, uh, metrics. Um, so this is, this, is, this is the idea where we're headed. We have a pretty good idea that we have solved or at least attempted to solve the idea on or, or the problem of assessing what we have and what we need to do to that soil to achieve a certain strength. And once this is done, then we can do all these wonderful things Adam is doing on a, on a much, bigger, uh, much bigger scale. Um, just quickly, as, as all faculty are interested in, this is kind of the, some of the output that's occurred. We've got proposals uh, with the EPA and NSF uh, pending. Uh, Jace has been giving nice presentations. We're going to uh, present some of our published work at a conference uh, in, in later in the spring. And so this, I just want to say, has been a very good experience from the faculty side, from the academic side, uh, working with the Hunt Institute. This is how it should work, right? We've got really cool cutting edge research happening. A student is doing all of it. He's, he's having to get his hands dirty and then go learn about neural networks and do that. So it's, it's, it's both things combined. And over here, then we come over and we can see it in use almost immediately with somebody who's out actually doing things with it. This is what we want, right? This is sometimes hard to do in academia. Right. And so to my students, yes, all that stuff I'm telling you can be used. It is real. Right. And you've seen some of those pictures today. Uh, so that uh, certainly is the end of my uh, prepared remarks. So I think Ava has some some. I would like to thank very much Adam and Brad for not only the presentation but their work and dedication in this area. Brad has been very humble. If we have been so fortunate that he joined this effort because really in a relatively little time he has come up with some amazing, brilliant ideas between you know uh, him and, 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 and Jess. They have just done so much work and has made, have made so much progress. And I'm happy to report that just recently, the World Bank expressed strong interest in, in, interest in this project, in supporting this project. We got some very favorable feedback from the EPA. So this is all going into a very exciting direction. So um, what I would love to do before we start the conversation is to say that um, given the, the progress we have made, we would like to start a working group. We would like to start an earth block working group. We would love to have any of you involved uh, with the idea that we recognize that it takes partnerships. It takes partnerships with construction companies, with communities, with others who are in some ways uh, related to this area. So if you have any interest in partnering up with us, please do let us know, any of us, and then we will start a formal working group and we will be um, getting together and, and working together going forward in a very collaborative way uh, with other stakeholders. So thank you so much again, and please uh, feel free to ask questions, and um, let's have a conversation about what we just saw. Yes. 